does. And sometimes we take a little extra time in the service, but it's okay because we're a family. And when we're a family, how many know when you have those moments, those special times, maybe you felt like, well, there was times that my kids weren't able to be dedicated or I wasn't. Guess what? You can step into a moment just like this and just receive blessings for you right now. You can receive blessings for you in moments like this. So I want to welcome you. If you're a guest today with us, I'm Pastor Lynn. I want to welcome you here. And uh, I also want to welcome all of those that join us every single week online from not only here locally, but from around the world. Can we give uh, just a big welcome right now to all of our people watching online, our online audience? Uh, we have several people uh, uh, Greta, Christine Wallace, Simbi, she's watching. Good to, good to see you, Christine. Uh, uh, Donna Bird, Matrisa Smith, some of our folks right there. Uh, Jeremiah Falcon, Lisa Jones. Um, let me see, Tessie Maddox. I have Le uh, Claudia Blunt, Ron Lucas. Um, what? What did I say? Did I say something wrong? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought I said, I thought I said a name wrong. Listen, uh, lots of people watching. We have people watching from Europe tonight. We have people watching, well, it's night their time. We have people watching in South Africa. We have people watching from South America, from Brazil. Right now, God is doing things all over the world. So I love that we're reaching beyond our four walls, and I, I don't want to steal a future uh, rain on a future parade that we're going to have, but uh, just a little hint, all of those funds that we've raised for the last few months to enhance our media equipment, our cameras, and all of that, we just put a check in for an order for those things. Come on. I, I'm not going to say any more because we're going to talk more about that later, and you're going to see what your faithfulness in giving is helping us to reach people all over the world and it's so exciting but today I'm going to jump in I'm going to put this in overdrive because I don't want to hold you too late but I want to leave you with a word today I want to welcome you to to part three of our series called Satan Unmasked have you enjoyed this series so far and yes we're going to be talking about the devil in church. Not only are we going to be talking about him, we're going to be exposing him. We're going to give you the tools you need to overcome him in your life because you are at war. There's a war going on and you're the target. And I want you to know that God has given you the strength and the tools that you need to be who you need to be without the interference of the devil. Amen. Amen. And I felt the Holy Spirit say to tell the people why you're doing this series today. And it isn't because it was uh, the Halloween season recently or because I wanted to scare you. The whole motivation of this series is really my, my actually hatred for the devil and my love for you. And my love for people everywhere. It, it, because there's a war that most people are unaware of, but they feel the implications of it. And most people don't have... Uh, the tools for categories to respond to it. We live in a time, there's a lot of change, a lot of turmoil, a lot of conflict, a lot of questions, a lot of all kinds of things. And I'm going to share more about this later because at the beginning of this year, I did a series called Stranger Things. And Stranger Things are coming. And I've been kind of silent throughout some things this year, but I feel like the Lord spoke to me yesterday that he's releasing the silence in the days to come. I'm going to be sharing some of the things that are going on from God's perspective and from his word because the Bible tells us exactly what's happening and what's going to happen as we move forward as people in a nation. Are you ready for that? And also, I want you to know, for those of you who are all worried and, and angst about the election or all excited about the election or whatever, whatever side you're on, the Bible says in Daniel 2.21 that God raises up kings and puts them down. He has times and seasons for everything, and there's purposes, and God's sovereign in the nations. The last I read, God is still on the throne. Amen. Amen. And we serve a kingdom above every kingdom. Amen. And this is important for you to understand because we get caught up in the idolatry of politics. And we put that above our trust in God. Amen? We have to trust God. God knows what he's doing. And he puts specific people for specific times for specific purposes. 
And that's all I'm going to say about that right now. But I'm going to say some more later, and it is going to be good stuff, I promise you. I've spent 31 years in full-time ministry. I've actively studied the Bible for nearly 40 years of my life, raised in church my entire life. And what I have seen over and over and over and over is that there really is an enemy. We really are at war, and we just have to remember we're not at war with each other. We're at war with the enemy. Amen? And we need to know about the victory of Jesus so we can walk in authority of freedom and out of deception and struggles. God has so much for us that we don't even realize. So I want to start by letting you know that the God you serve, Jesus Christ, is a devil slayer. He is a dragon slayer. That's who you serve today. And I want to show you that from the word. We live in a world that has been plagued throughout history with with, with corruption and dictators and dictatorial governments. I actually was in a, a, a um, Central American nation during a coup when a president of that nation was overthrown by a coup by another one and sent into the country where we are and stayed in the hotel in the room right above our floor. And I was in all of that. Uh, that craziness and I've seen the kind of chaos that can be caused by dictators and dictatorship because in a dictator government when you go to school as a young child you don't pledge allegiance to a flag or to a nation you pledge allegiance to the dictator in a dictator government the government oversees military the government oversees education the government oversees everyone and everything including the media and the result is that you only know what you're told. You never know the full story. A couple of years ago, there was an article in Newsweek magazine that exposed the dictatorial regime of North Korea. That's a country we've had a lot of, of interaction with in recent years. Uh, in North Korea, children in school would have to memorize the dictator's 10, 10 principles that ruled his kingdom. And they were actually intentional counterfeits of the Ten Commandments in the Bible. School children there were taught to hate Americans specifically. They were taken on field trips to reinforce an integral part of their education, hatred of the United States military, and a mission to seek revenge. They were shown different pictures and propaganda photos of American soldiers killing Korean children to stir them up. This was all in Newsweek uh, Newsweek magazine uh, about two and a half years ago. Uh, they would put American uniforms on dummies and children would take turns stabbing and attacking them to practice defending themselves against American aggression. Here's what I want you to see. What they saw was not exactly accurate. But what they saw was all they saw. That's all they knew. That's all they experienced. That's all they understood. And that was what the article was about specifically how a young generation can grow up under a dictatorial leadership and their whole worldview is skewed. Why am I sharing this? Because people in a dictatorship are, in a sense, captives born into a war. They're captives of a regime. They don't exactly know the truth. They don't know what is a lie and what's real. They can live in counterfeit and deception. This is what you see in dictator cultures. But you have to recognize that the same thing happens here. In the spiritual world, right in your own life. Evil is everywhere. The devil is a dictator. Well, thank you, Pastor Lynn. I feel so encouraged in church this morning. Hang with me. It might be a little heavy for a minute, but the end's going to be good, I promise. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we are going to go down to verse 3. And I just want to read a couple of these verses for you today because of time. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. And we'll put this scripture up as well. It says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds, everybody say minds, whose minds the God of this age or the God of this world has blinded 
who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Lord, I thank you today for your word. Lord, I thank you for the power to expose the enemy. And I thank you that all power in heaven and earth was given to you and you gave it to us today. And he has no power or effect over our lives. And Lord, I thank you that he will be absolutely defeated in every area, every family, every person listening to this message today in Jesus' name. Amen. So when you read the God of this age... The God of this world, it's talking about Satan and the demonic, powerful, fallen spirit world that exists around us every day. You can't see it with your natural eyes, but it is as real as everything you see with your natural eyes. This world we live in is ruled by an invisible force, an evil force. What does he do? He blinds the minds of people. He comes, that's what 1 Corinthians says, he blinds the minds of people. Some people have natural eyes that cannot see, they're physically blind, but other people have natural eyes that can see, but their minds are blind. And when your mind is blind, you see something, but you don't know how to make sense of it or interpret it, or you don't see it for what it is, so you end up living by the cues of the things around you. And we end up being controlled and manipulated by circumstances instead of by the Lord. And so my hope and prayer is that you would know today that there is a God of this world, but also know that Jesus is the God over that God. He is above all others. Nothing makes sense unless you consider everything around you in light of what God is doing and how the enemy is attacking Sometimes we get so focused on everything else that we forget there is a God of this world that is against us. You have an enemy. Listen, before you were saved, you didn't have an enemy because God is never your enemy. But when you become born again and you invite the Lord Jesus into your life, you're picking a fight with the devil. But let me tell you something, it's a worthy fight and you should fight and you should not quit until you've conquered because Jesus has already won the war that gives you the power to defeat the works of the devil in your life. But what happens is, if I don't recognize that there's a God of this world coming against me, I end up thinking that God is attacking me, that God is against me, that you can even wonder if God loves you. And he does, but there is a God of this world who does not. So we're born into a war, we're born into a a dictatorship in a sense, and we're born initially on the wrong side of the war. So Satan the dictator brainwashes and uses propaganda all around us until it's like that's all we've known and until we understand the word of God and what it says, this is why God's word is so powerful against the enemy, we can end up having a skewed view of truth and a skewed view of reality. We have names for this propaganda. It's called entertainment, education, politics, culture. But all these things can be just a rebrand of demonic deception. Many people in the body of Christ, even people here, even people I know here, have been affected in their thinking and belief systems because of educational systems, because of higher education. I've actually seen people shift their whole belief system after they go to college because they have a weakness on the inside that they did not see their minds got blinded along the way And they didn't see that this was actually the enemy trying to get them off focus from what God had called them to do and be. I've seen that. Major shifts in their faith. Major shifts in their worldview. And by the way, can I say this? As parents, you need to be aware and careful of where you send your kids to school and what's being taught to them in school. Especially if your kids are in the public school system, you need to be aware of what they're being taught. And we have way too many opportunities to get kids into education with Christian education. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about when you send your kids to college. 
be careful. Be careful. That is one of the, the most, right now, one of the strongest points in the war of the enemy against our generation is in our college campuses. Here's what, can I just say something prophetically? I also believe that God is getting ready to send a revival in the days to come and it's going to hit college campuses. I believe that with all my heart. I know you believe that, don't you, Derek? Derek's like, yes. <laughs> Derek and Ashley, they have a, a real heart for the college campuses. And they have in, in our 850 ministry as well. So I recently heard about some enrichment sem seminars offered. I wrote this down, so forgive me if it's a little rough. I just wrote it down um, this morning that are offered to teachers and students called equity summits. It's offered by the public school system in many states, including this one. An equity summit includes a series of workshops. They have versions for teachers, for students. And one of the workshops offered recently was on a subject called non-binary thinking. Non-binary thinking. Now, let me tell you, binary is the word that means, if you think about computers, if you ever learned about how computers operate, they operate with a series of ones and zeros. They call that binary code. It means there's only two things that make it all happen, right? So you've got binary, non-binary means there's more things at play in making something happen. So stay with me for a moment because you have to understand that biblical thinking is always binary thinking. Biblical thinking is always binary thinking, right and wrong, good and evil, moral, immoral, God Satan, etc. They should have titled the summit the Mind Blinded by the God of This World Summit, but then nobody would have come. But that's what it is. If you don't think in terms of God and Satan and heaven and hell and right and wrong and truth and lies, then listen close, you have a blind mind. When we start to have other things that we can evaluate and other choices we can make and mixtures and different things, it is not a biblical way of thinking. And then you can't accurately discern truth and reality. And you start believing things that are real that aren't real. And as I was reading about this, here's my question. When did the government get to take priority over the parents? When, if I disagree with secular curriculum writers, are they right and I'm wrong and I need to surrender and submit my family to the regime? And I'm not uneducated. I'm as educated as they are. Some of you may think, well, Pastor Lynn, this is getting a little offensive. We've only just begun. <laughs> but hang with me. It's going to get better. I told you, hang with me. Some of you listening may not have considered this. Well, that's just education. No, it's spiritual. Well, that's just entertainment. No, it's spiritual. Well, that's just politics. No, it's spiritual. Well, that's just the music I like to listen to. No, it's spiritual. How can we address all of our cultural conflicts one way spiritually? And I hear people say, well, you can't just be spiritual about everything. You have to be practical. Yes, but if the practical doesn't come out as spiritual, it'll end up being the wrong practical. Amen. Right? How can I say it's all spiritual? Because, because behind all the natural stuff is the God of this world. And we have to be directed by the God over this world. Amen? Some of you might be freaked out. And you're thinking, we went to the wrong church today. I heard Satan and demons and it's dark in the auditorium. <laughs> Listen, the, re <laughs> the reason some of you Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians don't know a whole lot about all this is because there's very little taught about it in churches. It's just not something that we get taught about. And, and, and that's why we have so many Christians that don't even believe the devil's real. But he's real. Trust me. That's why we're doing this series. You need to know that Satan is real. He's really wanting to destroy you. He's really wanting to destroy your children. He really wants to affect this generation. He really wants to affect our nation. He really wants to affect our world. He wants to stop Jesus from being seen. That's his ultimate goal. So I want to take you to a key scripture about war today. The very first war. If you want to turn all the way to the back of your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 12. 
The very first war, the great war, the war in heaven. It's the war behind all the other wars. Revelation 12, and I want you to look down at verse 7. Are you still with me? Yes. Hang it there. And war broke out in heaven. If you had to choose one word to describe the state of our world today, the state of our culture today, war is a good word. We are at war, but our war is shadowed by a bigger war. And I want you to see something. They were in heaven. They were in heaven. They were in church. They were having church. Angelic beings were worshiping God. And in the middle of the worship, anarchy entered in. Here's what I want you to know. You can be in church. You can be in God's presence. You can even be singing songs of worship and still have a heart at war with God. War broke out in heaven. Michael, which is one of two named angels in the Bible along with Gabriel, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Now I want you to notice that Satan does not have equality with God. It is not God over here and the devil over here. The devil's not at war with God. God's throne is secure. He's in heaven, right? He's on the throne. So God does not engage the devil. Instead, he deploys angelic soldiers to battle on behalf of the kingdom. Now guess who the devil's fighting with? You and me. And he gives us the power and ability and deploys us to have victory over the devil. And I want you to look at the language used to describe Satan, dragon. Isn't it amazing that in our whole culture, fantasy movies, board games, books, that somewhere along the way you're usually going to encounter a what? A dragon. There's an unusual intrigue with dragons. We see them usually as evil or bad, but we're intrigued with them at the same time. So here we see a dragon, the first dragon. It's the serpent. It's Satan. It's the enemy of God. So Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. One of the translations says they fought back. They fought with the dragon. This is the big war behind all the other wars. But they did not prevail. That's the good news. I'm going to read that again. They did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. What part of the world? The whole world. What this means is demons live where you live. Demons work where you work. Some of you are saying, yeah, I know a couple of them by name. Demons watch what you're doing. Demons watch what triggers you. This war against God... God ultimately was victorious, but the war moved. It moved here into your life, into your house, into your marriage, into your family, into your city, into your nation, and into your world. So I want you to see that everyone, every one of you is born into a battle that began in heaven. What's worse, we were all born under the enemy's side. And there's nothing we could do about it. And we'll see in a minute, that's what makes Jesus so important. But the good news is, since God wins the great war, and since when we can be rescued and come back into relationship with God, that means there's hope for you and me through our relationship with him. We can walk in victory and we can win our war because he already won it. So this great war is the battle behind battles, the conflict behind the conflicts, and the war is in two realms. Because in addition to the realm we can see, there's also a realm that only God sees. 
And these two realms affect and combat each other relentlessly. And often the conflict we experience is the unseen realm showing up in the seen realm. And deceiving us into not wanting to recognize the real cause of the problem. So let's go back to the beginning. And we spoke about this in the last message. I told you I'm giving you this stuff real quick. You don't have to turn there. But in Genesis 3 and verse 1, on the other end of your Bible, it says this. Now the serpent, Satan, the dragon, was more cunning. If you remember from our last message, I talked about that. It meant he was crafty. He was scandalous. He was creatively evil. He was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Here's what I want you to know today. In the places you don't have a strategy, you need to know that Satan does have a strategy. He has a plan to destroy your marriage, so you need to have a plan for your marriage. Satan has a plan to destroy you relationally, so you need to have a strategy for your relationships. He wants to destroy you emotionally. He wants to destroy you financially and in every other way. He is a strategist at war. So you need to get a strategy from heaven so that the enemy's strategies against you will not work. You're his target. So the story of Adam and Eve continues, Eve encounters and has a conversation with the serpent. We talked about that last time. And everything falls apart when the war is effectually lost by Adam and Eve in the garden. And I want you to see something. Just like with Eve, Satan shows up uninvited in hopes you will have a conversation with him. Did Adam and Eve invite Satan? No, he just showed up. How does Satan operate in our lives? He just shows up. He is not an invited guest. Well, what did I do to deserve this? No, nope, he just shows up. And he hopes when he shows up that he can engage you in a conversation. Did Adam and Eve need to have a conversation with the dragon? No. They could have been like, we have a strict no dragon policy. Adam could have stepped forward and said, we love God, God loves us. If you have a problem, take it up with God. We're not going to discuss it with you. Imagine if we had that attitude. We're not going to discuss it. Take it up with God. I'm not discussing this with you. What God says goes in our life. There are certain conversations you don't need to enter into. There are certain relationships you don't need to enter into. Be careful what you allow to engage you because it can mess everything else up if you are not walking in the Spirit, listening to the Lord. Be careful. Ultimately, I can tell you from experience, I've messed a lot of things up because I engaged in conversations I should not have. Because I said things I should not have. I got emotional about something. And the enemy was inviting me into a conversation and I didn't even realize it until later. When you're tempted, that's a recruiting. Satan is a recruiter. He recruited angels in heaven. And he recruits people on earth. And Satan wants to recruit you. When you're tempted, when a lie comes, it's Satan recruiting. Every sin and failure and fear is a recruitment. He is fighting to keep you in his grip. Be careful. Because there are some people that give into it so much they have a propensity to be demonic and evil. They may not be beyond help, but they're beyond your help. They need God's help. Amen? And you can't be God for somebody else. You're not that big. Right? So for all of us, until we turn to God, actually for any of us, there's no hope for us either. We're just like the demons. There's no hope if we don't grab a hold of Jesus. By the way, not everyone is demonic. And let me say this, just because somebody disagrees with you, it does not mean they're demonic. I read that recently on social media. It takes more than that. But Satan is always recruiting people. Some people are in such bondage, they do evil constantly. And listen... I want you to understand when Satan does evil, it's always connected to rebellion. 
Satan is a rebel and he wants you to follow rebellion, living independently from God. So in the face of God's authority, rulership, and kingdom, Satan declared, I want to be like the Most High. I want to be independent of God's authority. He said, I want to be like him. Demons, same rebellion. And let me say this and be very clear. If you reject God-given, God-placed authority in your life, you open the door to the demonic. If you reject, if God puts you somewhere under someone and you get upset, you leave, you go away, you rebel, whatever, you're opening the door to the enemy. You're inviting him in for a conversation that he is not invited to. You hear me? God does not support rebellion ever or lawlessness if it is God's authority. Our culture doesn't understand this, so our children are encouraged to rebel against parents. Citizens encouraged to rebel against leadership. And what you end up is with hell up rebellion instead of heaven down life giving. Satan wants you to live with an independent spirit. And if your thought is, I'm my own person, I'm my own authority, I take care of myself, I look out for number one, I make my own decision, nobody tells me what to do, you're in danger of losing the battle. It is a spirit that Satan operates in because he's always trying to put himself in headship. He always is. He's trying to be the head over God. He tries to be the head over humanity. He's constantly trying to put himself as the authority over every sphere of human culture. Family, finance, media, politics, entertainment, on and on. Every sphere of your life, Satan wants to control. He wants dominion over all because he desires to unseat and supplant the true God. I'm exposing him today to you. He manipulates with lies, trying to convince us like he did with Adam and Eve that God is trying to withhold something good from us. God makes them in his likeness. He puts them in the garden. He provides for all of their needs. And Satan comes along in effect and he says, there's something good that God's withholding from you. They could have everything they wanted. God said, don't eat or touch this one thing. And they told Satan that. And a demonic lie comes out. He says, you will not surely die. And I talked a little bit about this before, but we think that that, that, that temptation in the Garden of Eden was about how pretty the apple was or how tasty the fruit was. They had tons of fruit. They weren't hungry. No, the Bible says that Satan said, in the day you eat of it, you will be like God knowing good and evil. They wanted to be like God. Satan was trapping them into what he wanted. The same temptation. They were hoping that they would get something revealed to them that through the devil's lie, they thought was being withheld from them. So they reacted according to what they believed. And listen, you are what you believe. And if your belief system is not in truth, you'll end up in deception. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So truth is not an idea or a concept, truth is a person. Anything disconnected from Jesus is not true, even if it's real. You hear what I'm saying to you? He also said of the devil, he said, you were a liar from the beginning, you're the father of all lies, there's no truth in you. So the devil is a liar and he operates completely by lies. But if he can get you to put your belief system, which is what God created you with, everybody has belief, everybody has faith, everybody believes stuff. If he can get you to put your belief into a lie rather than the truth, that lie will become your reality. And you'll live in it. I use this example in counseling a lot. If you walk into a dimly lit room and you see something on the ground that looks like a snake... You might be scared and run out of the room. You're going to feel fear. You're going to feel panic if you're afraid of snakes. You're going to feel that stuff. You're going to get out of the room. But if somebody comes up and turns the light on and you see what you thought was a snake is really just a rope on the ground, 
you don't feel fear anymore. You don't feel. Why? Because you know the truth. But here's the thing. The truth is it was never a snake. You didn't react on what was true. You reacted on what you believed. And if what you believe, that lie as though it was true, your feelings, your fears, your reactions, and everything are the same as though it was actually true. That's how the devil gets you. He always is telling you that the rope is a snake. And you're always reacting and responding and fearful or angry or whatever else because the enemy's lies get you into deception, keep you away from the purposes of God and lock you into bondage, keep you from moving forward, keep you from being happy, keep you from being fulfilled in your life. The devil operates by lies. You have to step into truth and truth is Jesus. If Jesus said it, it's true. Are you with me? This is important. So when Eve was deceived, it's important to remember, Adam was with her. He let her eat the fruit first. They didn't know what death was. I think Adam wanted to see what would happen to Eve. It's like, you bite it, let me see what happens. Eve took the fruit. That's not a theology that's preached often, but I'm just telling you. So women don't, a lot of times you're made to be the evil one. Adam was right there. I want you to see that we can make some mistakes trying to be helpful. It's not enough just to want to do the right thing. You need to know what the wise thing is to do in every situation. For many of you, the enemy deceives and manipulates your desire to be helpful, your desire to do the right thing. You want right things. You're trying to go after right things. And you end up being helpful in ways that are not wise for, for some Ladies, in, in their marriages, it looks like uh, in our day, you're married, but your husband is irresponsible, so you treat him like one of the children, and you're trying to pick up messes after him. And your marriage ends up looking like the deadbeat boyfriend who's living with his girlfriend, and she's paying the bills, basically nannying a guy with a driver's license. Some of you are like, I shouldn't have brought my girlfriend. I hope my wife doesn't hear with me, hear this. She might kick me out. In Jesus' name, yes. <laughs> For you men, let me tell you this. If you don't lead your family, Satan will. Adam is too passive in the situation. He's distant. He doesn't step forward. And as a result, Satan steps in and leads his family. Adam ends up falling into sin with his wife, eating the forbidden fruit, and everything falls apart. And that's how it happened, and it started with a demonic lie. So let me say this. Temptation was not about how good the fruit was. It was what the fruit would do. Right? It's the war we all fight inside of us, wanting to be in control, wanting right things, but wanting to be in charge, wanting, wanting to have power, wanting to have knowledge. Sometimes the best thing you could do is acknowledge, I don't have the power, I don't have the ability, I'm taking my hands off, God, it's yours. I trust you, you're my Lord, I can obey you, I'm not going to try to fix this person, I'm not going to try to change this relationship, I'm not going to try to fix my husband, my wife, my kid, I've got to let you handle it, God. Sometimes that's how it has to be. And that's how we win the war. So if you look on down a few verses in Genesis 3.15, God gives a promise. And this is the beginning of the good part of the message. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This was a promise of one that would come that would be the answer to the war. His name is Jesus. He came. He died in our place. He conquered death and hell. And we have victory through him. So the answer to Satan, the liar, is always Jesus, the truth. God promised that one day Jesus would come. He would slay the dragon. He would kill the serpent. Light conquers darkness. Truth conquers lies. And Jesus conquers Satan every time. Every time. John said it this way. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus is truth. It's not just truth that makes you free it's knowing the truth that's why I'm preaching this to you 
Because sometimes there's truth out, truth out there, we just didn't know it. And once you know it, you can apply it to your life and it changes everything. Ultimately, the problem that entered this world does not have a solution from this world. You and I need somebody to enter from the outside so we can win the war that was lost. We've already surrendered too much. Come on, any comic book fans, any superhero fans in here? Come on, where are my superhero people? Where's my Pensacon clan? Do I have any of those in here? Come on. When you watch these superhero stories on the big screen, it's almost always the same thing. Humanity's in peril. The world is in crisis. An end is coming. And then someone from the outside world comes in to save the day. Superman, Thor, Incredible Hulk, Aquaman, on and on. They're human or they're human-like yet more it's the gospel god should get a royalty for every superhero movie it's a stolen story get this we want to deliver that comes in and is like us but greater and there's powerful news today greater than any superhero greater than any bad guy greater than any dragon is the lord jesus christ he comes in as a man but the god man he's not just a mythical story he is an actual powerful deliverer he is a dragon slayer a devil killer a victory winner and you have a relationship with him Amen. Jesus enters human history. God beats Superman. He, the God man beats Iron Man, Batman, he, uh, any other man, right? He does. So today we have hope for this planet, but it's not hope that comes from this planet. Come on. This is awesome. I'm so excited. Sorry if I interrupted your nap. Listen, God is doing something great. If we will get a hold of what he's doing in our day, we are living in one of the greatest times the earth has ever seen. If we will get a hold of the purposes of God for the times in which we live. Come on. So how does Jesus come to help us effectively win the war? Well, he's the war master against the enemy. And one of the central spiritual moments of that warfare happens in the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He goes into the wilderness. Now, if you notice, Adam and Eve were in the garden. They got cast into the wilderness. And Jesus shows up in the wilderness to pick up where Adam left off. Who shows up in the wilderness? Satan. He shows up to tempt Jesus. Jesus is there. He's hungry, he's isolated. He's tired. Satan will always show up when you're hungry and isolated and tired. Jesus had been fasting. That's a whole message by itself. Jesus had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days. Satan shows up. Let's make some bread and share a meal, Jesus. He tempts Jesus a second time. He takes him to the highest point of the temple. He says, throw yourself down, Jesus. The angels will catch you. Everyone will see and know who you really are. They'll know that you're the son of God. He offers Jesus the opportunity to prove his identity. It's what the enemy is out to destroy with most of us in this generation, our identity. Prove who you are, Jesus. It's a temptation to try to show off, to be impressive, to be seen by others as, as valuable in our culture. Third temptation, he comes to Jesus and shows him the kingdoms of this world. And Satan says, if you'll just bow down to me, since I'm the kind of the, the, the God of this world, all these kingdoms that you came to rescue by dying on the cross, I'll just give them to you. No cross required. I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. So he offers Jesus a pleasure path instead of the pain path. I'll give it to you, Jesus. You won't have to die for it. A kingdom without a cross. It's what a lot of believers look for today. If you were in Jesus' position, which one would you choose? Listen, if you only do what looks good and feels good in the moment... 
you might be surrendering to the serpent. And this was ultimately an issue of worship. Satan wanted to be worshipped. Understand something. Worship is war. Why do we spend so much time in worship? Why do we push into worship? Because worship is war. It's a war to get to worship. It's a war to stay in worship. It's a war to sing God's praises with God's people in God's presence. But it is the conquering force of the devil. I'm telling you, worship is a weapon of your warfare that you will win the battle with. And I'm going to show you why this is all relevant. And then we're going to kind of land the plane here in just a second. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, it says this. For all that is in the world, everybody say world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He basically said every weapon you will ever encounter from the enemy against you can be summed up in one of these three things. And it says, and the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. If you want victory in your life, if you want to win this war, listen closely because it's the most important part of this message. You are going to have to face these three weapons of the enemy and conquer them. Lust of the flesh, it's my temptation to feel, my passion. I want to feel good. I deserve to feel good. I desire those things that make me feel good. Lust of the eyes, that's my possession, the temptation to have. I see it, I want it. It's materialism. And the pride of life. That's position, the temptation to be. I want to be admired. I want to be envied. I want to be worshipped. I don't need God. I am my own God. These things will always show up in your life. They will show up in your marriage. They will show up in your family. They will show up where you work, everywhere. Listen, you will face, if you are in this battle and you are, are, uh, you have gotten a hold of Jesus Christ, you will face these three things somewhere. From the Garden of Eden, it was there to the wilderness of Jesus' temptation. You see these three things. In the Garden of Eden, Eve saw that the fruit was good for food, lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes. And desirable to make one wise, pride of life. They were all at the temptation of Jesus. Turn these stones into bread, Jesus. Lust of the flesh. Cast yourself from the temple. The angels will catch you. And everyone will see you're the son of God. Pride of life. Bow down to me and I will give you all these things. Lust of the eyes. 1 John 2 goes on to say, The world and everything in it is passing away. The world and everything in it is passing away. Listen, the world and everything in the world is passing away. Don't get too worked up about it. It's passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Here's your three weapons to win the war. The lust of the flesh, your weapon, is integrity. Integrity is a life of wholeness. You're walking out the will of God. That means you don't compartmentalize. Integrity is who you are when nobody is looking. The weapon to conquer the lust of the eyes is generosity. The only antidote for materialism is giving and generosity. And by the way... You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And the third weapon to conquer the pride of life is humility. You see, we, can't, we tend to respond with the same spirit. Somebody's angry at me, I get angry back at them. Right? Somebody tries to push pridefulness on me, I want to be prideful back to them. But you have to conquer spirits with opposite spirits. And humility conquers the pride of life. 
Humility is not about denying your strengths. It's being honest about your weaknesses. True humility is a choice. And if I don't humble myself, I'll end up being humiliated. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. These are the weapons, integrity, generosity, and humility. You want to win the war against the devil? A, go through the doorway of worship and conquer him with integrity, generosity, humility. That's it. Because Satan doesn't give in. He doesn't quit fighting this war. At the end of Jesus' life, he takes one of his closest friends... And uses him to betray him. They arrest Jesus under the cover of darkness. Accuse him. Beat him and nail him to a Roman cross. And the demons were rejoicing. Because they thought they were winning. And I'm closing today. But I want you to hear this. You you don't turn there. In 1 Corinthians 2. It says in verse 8. None of the rulers of this age. Who are the rulers of this age? Demonic, rebellious, fallen spirits. None of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had they known what Jesus was really doing, they would have never killed him. Right? Satan had thought he had power. He thought he had victory over Jesus. But what God did at the cross is he took your worst evil. He took your darkest moments, your greatest mistakes, and he used it for the greatest good. What Satan and demons didn't understand is that he's not dying, he's paying. He's not dying, he's rescuing the people that he loves. He took your place, he took my place. He paid our price at the cross. He endured all that we should have endured so that we could have all the victory that he gives us. Only God does love and forgiveness. Only God does love and forgiveness. Satan and demons overlooked this possibility because they knew nothing of love and forgiveness. That's why they didn't get what was happening. If they had gotten it, they would have never killed Jesus. But he died. He paid the price. It was final. Rose from the dead. Took back the keys of hell and death and the grave. Has victory over Satan. Slayed the dragon. Killed the enemy. That's where we have to live. This is who you are. You are in the army of the dragon slayer. He has already conquered, giving you every weapon you need to defeat the enemy in your life. Satan is not victorious. Jesus is. Come on, close your eyes with me right now. I mean, I feel the presence and the power of God. I'm so excited because when you understand the works of the enemy, Jesus came, First John says, to destroy the works of the devil. That was the purpose he came. And today he's going to destroy the works of the devil in your life. And I know we're, we're going a little bit long, but listen, just hang with me for two more minutes because God wants to rescue you out of some stuff. There have been relationships, people, things you've been battling Conflicts, sometimes even the little conflicts will just take you down. And the enemy says, I'm going to destroy this. There's nothing you can do about it. He'll lie to you about the person that you're married to. He'll lie to you about the people in your life. He'll lie to you about your church. He'll lie to you about things you see. Don't listen to his lies. Just listen to the voice of God today. God says, I have a purpose for every place and every connection and every point that you are today. I'm on the throne, I'm ready, we're moving forward, the kingdom of God, (laughs) come on, he reigns over the God of this world. Some of you have been battling in practical areas, resources, finances, things, there's people, I don't know who I'm talking to, I believe there's two people in this room right now here present that you've been battling so much with depression lately and you don't even know why, God is going to break that. It is a lie of the devil and he has no hold on you. 
You see, when you're a child of God, the devil isn't allowed to touch you. The problem is the devil's a lawbreaker. He doesn't obey the law, so you have to enforce it. You have to command him in the name above every name, Jesus, your savior, the dragon slayer. You have to command him to get off of your mind, off of your life, out of your resources, out of your health. Come on, out of, out of your family. Today, Jesus is greater. But first you have to know him. And maybe there's somebody here, maybe you're watching online today and you don't know him. Today, you need to know him. All you have to do is ask. He's there for you. Say, Jesus, you came, you died to pay for what I couldn't pay for, to get me off of the wrong side of the war. Lord, I give my life to you, my heart to you. Come and forgive me. And watch what God will do. He'll begin to take a relationship with you, and he will empower you to step forward doesn't mean your battles are over they might get worse but you will have victory in the end because the greater one is in you Jesus come on just stand to your feet with me if you're here if you're watching online just find a place for just a moment and don't and don't go anywhere because God is speaking to you if I'm talking to you right now if this message spoke to you if you say Pastor Lynn there's something that right now I feel like I've been in a battle it might even be a little thing but I feel like I'm buried by it. For some reason, I feel like I'm suffocating. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but if that's you, I want us to pray for you right now. I want to invite you to get out of your seat. I want you to come to the front. We're going to minister to you. If you're, if you're watching online, just get ready. We're going to pray right here. God has no distance. He can come to you wherever you are. If you're here and that was you and you say, I've been battling that depression, or you're watching that, somebody online, come right now. God, if it's something uh, that you're, you're battling with in your life, maybe it's finances, maybe it's relationship, man, I don't care what it is. Wherever this message spoke to you right now, we're going to pray and we're going to declare that the enemy's back is broken. His voice is broken over everything. Come on. He who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. That's what the Bible says. Maybe you're here and you're like, Pastor Lynn, I don't even know if I really know God. I don't know if I'm right with God. We want to pray with you. Just tell whoever's praying for you. I want to give my life to Jesus. And they're going to pray with you right now. If that's you, just come down to the front. There's nothing special about the front. It just makes it easier for us to minister to you. And I believe when you step out into something, that act of faith opens the doors of heaven over you. Amen. Come on, if you're at your seats, would you just, I'm going to invite our ministry team down, and we're going to begin praying. Would you just stretch your hands forward to these that are up here right now? And I want you to begin praying. Come on, for the next 30 seconds, just pray fervently right now. Come on, in the name of Jesus, I break the power and the work of the enemy. I break the work of the enemy. Devil, I command your grip to release in the name of Jesus. I thank you, God. Your works will not be stopped. Your purposes will not be stopped. Oh, All the pain go. Every physical thing change. Right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, God, I thank you. Lord, that you are king. Come on, pray with me. Come on, right now.
Come on, you're surrounded by him today. I'm surrounded. Come on, get a hold of heaven today. Get a hold of heaven today. Come on, it's how I fight. How are we fighting? In worship. Come on, before you leave today, just lift your hands one more time and just begin to worship. This is how, Lord, this is how I fight my battles like David did. Lord, you said you trained his hands for war and his fingers for battle, God. Lord, he was a worshiper, God. Lord, I thank you that everything we need, we find in you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you that every power and work of the devil is conquered over this house, over every family. Lord, for everyone watching right now, God, on live stream, God, over this place, Lord, I pray over them right now. Lord, I pray that your hands would go through the the screen, the computer, wherever they're watching. And Lord, that you would just awaken things in them, that they would see things they've never seen, oh God. Lord, I thank you today, God, that you have begun something good in us and you're gonna complete it. And that we're getting ready to walk through after one of the craziest years, one of the greatest holiday seasons that we've ever walked in. And Lord, I thank you for that. And I praise you that your blessings would overtake us, God. And Lord, I praise you for what you're going to do already before you even do it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, worship. That's how you win. Worship is how you win. Come on. Come on. Well, we're going to continue ministering. If you need special prayer, we want to pray for you. Please come. We want to pray for you. And we won't have a formal dismissal. Thank you for being in Jubilee today. Thank you for watching online on live stream. You can call the church. 850-474-9484. This week, somebody will minister to you. God bless you. Conquer the devil this week. You're more than a conqueror. You're victorious in him.